You are listening to the Field Ethos Podcast, the global hunt for adventure, bringing you stories and interviews from adventure seekers, hunters, anglers, and the outdoor-minded. This episode of the Field Ethos Podcast has been sponsored by Russell Moccasin. From its early beginning in 1898, Russell Moccasin has dedicated itself to providing hunters, outdoorsmen, and women with the finest handmade, custom-fitted moccasin-style boots and shoes available anywhere at any price. Their hand-built process means you can customize your boots from over 100 different leathers of the highest quality. From waterproof cowhide or bison to alligator and elephant and a variety of hues and colors, you can make it your own by choosing from one of more than two dozen different sole options. Check out Russell Moccasin's feature on fieldethos.com and learn more about why Russell Moccasin is the finest custom hunting boot and outdoor footwear maker in the world. Hey guys, another episode of Field Ethos Podcast. This is Jason Vincent. I have Jay Ryan with me. Say hello, Jay. Hey, everybody. So this is an intro into um, our podcast uh, that we recently did with um, Jack Carr, who is a successful writer. I'd say somewhat of an emerging, emerging writer, wouldn't you say, Jay? Uh, if you want to quantify already having two books in the bag as emerging, but yeah, in our space, he's pretty solidified, but I think his wider acceptance, he's definitely emerging. Yeah. And his genre, I'd say he's emerging. You know, a lot of the other successful writers in his genre have had, you know, 13, 14, 20 books. Uh, and they've been doing it for a long time. So Jack just finished his third book. Uh, it's called Savage Sun. His first book was called Terminal List. His second book, which is one of my favorite books ever, is called True Believer. Uh, just an exceptional book that somehow he was able to incorporate being on the run with sailing, with going underground kind of in Africa as uh, anti-poaching efforts on a ranch in Mozambique and then back to the United States for some good old fashioned revenge. So book two was incredible. Savage Sun, again, that's pre-release. I've got that one. So don't want to give too much of it away. It's very, very, very good. It's very dark. I know you haven't had a chance to read any of it, Jay. So I'm going to loan it to you. I should be done with it tonight. But I'll read faster. That. Yeah, I need, I need to read <laughs> faster. I just haven't had much time, but um, the, the book is incredible. It, like I said, it's very dark. There are some things in this book that you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to hang out with Jack Carr after this one. <laughs> but it is very cool. And and I'm halfway kidding about that because Jack Carr, and you will hear on the podcast, is one of the world's coolest dudes, don't you think? No, absolutely. He's one of the most down-to-earth uh, SEALs I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, uh, let alone uh, successful writers. So give us a little bit of background into Jack Carr. I know a good bit myself, but because you come from that world, tell us a little bit about Jack. Sure. So Naval officer, Navy SEAL officer, um, he led a bunch of operations in Naval Special Warfare, uh, troop commander, et cetera, um, multiple deployments to the Middle East in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. So he's combat experience. He's been there, done that. He is the guy who can give you that first perspective view into what it's like to be the operator. And he absolutely does in his books. Yeah, I, th- I feel like there's a lot of realism that he brings to his writing. I think a lot of the other writers in his genre, um, Vince Flynn, who has been uh, deceased now for several years, who was absolutely my favorite for a long time. He's been replaced by Kyle Mills, who took over the Mitch Rapp series. Both just incredible writers. Um, Some of my favorite books that I've ever read for sure but they didn't really have the same type of experience and background that Jack brings to the table. So he's kind of been there, done that for a lot of the fictitious elements in his books. Um, They're not quite as fictitious for him. So he's, you know, he brings some credibility and, and kind of a different voice to that genre. And I really like it. Yeah. If you like Vince Flynn, if you like Brad Thor, if that is your genre, uh, Jack Carr is going to be right up your alley. He is. And, and again, all three books are great. Um, I can't recommend them enough. I like Jack a lot, though. He's very approachable. I met him uh, backstage at NRA last year. And I knew I recognized him. I had just finished Terminal List, which, by the way, you recommended to me. 
Oh yeah, you can't. You're the one that missed that book. Read that one. That one's a sleeper. Yeah, it is. It is. You pushed me to read that one. I picked it up. I read it almost start to finish. He walks up to a friend of mine backstage at NRA, and he's talking to him. And I was looking at him, and I'm like, I know who this guy is. How do I know who this guy is? Well, I'd seen him on the inside cover of the book, his photo, but I just couldn't make the connection. Then I went, Ah that's Jack Carr. So I kind of interrupted him while he was talking to Gary Turner, who's a really good friend of mine. Gary owns tally rings and those guys were talking. And so um, I kind of pushed Gary out of the way and started talking to Jack, which Gary is, (laughs) I think maybe he's, he, he, he had something else to worry about. He had just accidentally run his mouth to Chuck Liddell. So I think he was kind of looking over his shoulder to make sure he wasn't going to get his ass whipped by Chuck. So (laughs) I, I used that opportunity to to talk with Jack and um, I spent maybe five, 10 minutes talking with him. And when we uh, went our own direction, I just thought, what a cool dude. He's just super laid back, very cool experiences, very genuinely nice guy. And you can tell that he's a deep thinker, which our resident seal at field ethos Davis Boyce is also a deep thinker. So maybe that runs in the seal mentality. Uh, But Jack is like very, very much a book nerd. In a good way. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the conversation with being a book nerd is that's that's a good thing. Well, the conversation we had with him where we asked him, you know, kind of his reading list and what he's into and and preface this, this conversation took back uh, some time ago before he launched his official book list, which is up now live on his website. Um, He is hardcore in it. And if you follow his social media, you'll see when he does a lot of his posts in front of his bookshelves, he's got two massively stocked shelves on either side of him. And those are often two or three books deep. So he is is, himself. This guy reads all the time. He told us this book list. I've watched his Instagram posts lately. And he's like, this is the book of the week. And I'm like, dude, I can't finish that in a week. (laughs) <laughs> where, where, where do people find the time to read a book like that in a week? So just to give you an idea of how busy Jack is, he is wrapping up the release of book three. He's already working on book four. I believe he is a consultant on SEAL Team, the television show. I know he is involved with them on some level. I know he's done some consulting with them. I don't know how regular that is, but I think it's a lot more regular than people realize. He's also, I believe, working on maybe a release of a TV show behind the James Reese story, which James Reese, for those of you who don't know, is the lead character in all of Jack's books. So it looks like there may be a TV show coming with Chris Pratt, of all people. Playing which would be huge. Yeah. James Reese. Chris Pratt is so cool. The dude's awesome. Well, of the Hollywood establishment, he's definitely the most uh, American, if you had to put a title on it. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to keep political titles out of that. He's just (laughs) a true bro, a true American bro. I don't know. I don't really care um, to, to know much about Hollywood elite politics and, you know, that nonsense that, that goes on out there. But, I do know that Jack, uh, that, that Chris, I'm sorry, represents kind of a more wholesome, everyday American dude. He's an outdoorsman. He's obviously in love with being a dad. He's just a cool dude. I've never met him, so maybe he's not a cool dude, but I just, <laughs> he seems I, like it. <laughs> I just have to think that he's very cool. And I will say, I do know that he and Jack Carr uh, went on a trip together jack and i talked about it recently and jack says he's cool and because we know jack's cool by osmosis chris pratt is cool as shit yep cool as shit by osmosis sheer definition absolutely yeah okay so without further ado let's jump into it yeah let's let's listen to the jack Carr podcast it's one of our first so bear with us on this one Good, good. Well, that's a perfect point to uh, start the conversation here. Good whiskey. Uh, I definitely appreciate that. 
Uh, welcome, folks, to the Field Ethos Podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm joined tonight by our other host, Jason Vincent. Our special guest Howdy, guys. is Jack Carr, none other than the living legend in modern writing, Jack Carr. Uh, just a little intro, Jack Carr led special operations teams as a team leader, platoon commander, and troop commander, and task unit commander. Uh, over 20 years in naval special warfare, uh, both from the enlisted side to the officer side. Uh, that's kind of the headlines, Jack. But Jack, I'd like for you to kind of take a moment and do your own intro. Um, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to writing and the writing that you're doing and, and where you're going here in the near future from an introduction standpoint. Yeah, let's do it. Well, thank you guys so much for having me on. It is an honor to be here. And yeah, I'll, I know I'll start with where I am now. I'll start with the writing because that's what I've, well, the two things I wanted to do my entire life were one, serve my country in uniform, specifically as a SEAL. And two was to write fiction in this genre. And that comes from growing up with a mother who's a librarian uh, and still is. So I grew up with a love of books, a uh, love of reading, just surrounded by books. And back in the 80s, when you decided you wanted to be a, a SEAL or really anything in special operations, uh, there was a finite number of books and magazines out there that you could turn to to get information. And you could go through those in about an hour in the early 80s. There was hardly anything written specifically about SEALs. There's hardly anything written about them. Um, so my mom was a librarian. We went down to the local library, did some research, and my takeaway was uh, whether it's true or not, uh, as a seven-year-old, they got me with, uh, with the SEALs are some of the most elite uh, special operations forces in the world, and the training is some of the toughest ever devised by a modern military. So they had me with that. Um, but after I read that, there wasn't much else. So uh, I turned to fiction. And I just loved reading the Tom Clancy. So it was right about the time when Tom Clancy came out. So fifth, sixth grade, I'm transitioning from more of that young adult reader into reading the stuff that my parents were reading. So the Tom Clancy's, Nelson DeMille's, David Morell's, A.J. Quinnell's, J.C. Pollock, these guys in the 80s who all had protagonists with essentially special operations backgrounds from Vietnam, mostly in the 80s. That's what, that's what the protagonists had. So I just loved reading those novels and I eagerly await the next ones. And I knew that one day, after serving my country in uniform, I would write fiction in that genre. So uh, I always knew what I was going to do. And as my time in the SEAL teams was coming to an end, I thought, okay, this is it. This is the time to give that next dream a shot and wrote down six or seven different ideas and picked the one that I thought was going to be the most visceral, the most hard hitting out of the gate, the most primal, which was the terminal list. That was book number one. And uh, so got to work on that one. So that's kind of what led me here. And now I'm a full-time author and uh, loving every minute. That's awesome. So um, you're you're a total book nerd, um, big time, um, and uh, and it sounds like you have been for your entire life, which is great because Jay and I are both major book nerds. Same. Um, and unfortunately, you just uh, you don't find a lot of people these days that like to read as much as we do. Um, and one thing I one thing I have thought was funny um, recently, just watching you in social media, is your uh, your immense love for the Lethal Weapon series. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it, a very uh, it's, uh, important at a time when I was very impressionable uh, in my youth. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it definitely, it, you can you can see some of it in the books for sure. Um, just that really cool, strong character. Um, you know, some rigs there for sure. Yeah, Martin Riggs, um, who's my go-to back in the day. Um, yeah, that's sure. awesome. Back, you know? uh, yeah, I love the, the, the tattoo. It had a knife even, you know, and I love that scene. So it's a yeah. lethal weapon fan. One of the first sniper movies out there. People don't usually think of it as a sniper movie, but, uh, but it is. Before we go into much detail about the books, um, I wanted to talk about some of your uh, hunting background. Um, I've seen it bleed into the books and both books really uh, from really the first scene in Terminal List where um you've got a guy not to give too much away, but um, you don't really know who you're dealing with at first, uh, but you've got a guy that is using an ultralight hunting rifle. If I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've read it, but um, that first shot that it comes as the guy's coming down the road, doesn't that, doesn't that shot occur with a, with a hunting rifle instead of um, a really tactical oriented type of rifle? It does. It does. So uh, that's where the reader is introduced to James Reese, the uh, the protagonist of the series, and who is a, who is a hunter, and he uses a hunting rifle to uh, make it look like a, the first the first killing to make it look like a hunt, like a hunting accident. 
So what's happened is he's, he's a former Navy SEAL sniper enlisted who becomes an officer. And uh, he's at that stage in his time in uniform when it's, he won't be leading guys tactically on the battlefield anymore. And that's where I found myself when I uh, decided to, to move on and get out of the military and move on to that next stage in life and take care of my family. So uh, I was at the same stage as the character is uh, when I started writing the novel. Um, and as a brief background, the character is involved in a conspiracy to test drugs on our nation's most elite soldiers that have side effects. And I got that idea from the church hearings in the 70s when really uh, Frank Church of Idaho, um, he uh, and a committee uh, really dove into things that elements of our federal government had been doing and that weren't quite legal. And a lot of things came out of those hearings, uh, one of which was that drugs were tested on uh, military people. Uh, mental patients, uh, university students, really without their uh, their knowledge or consent of what uh, the side effects could be. So uh, I figured, hey, what if somebody didn't get the memo on that? They try it again with a beta blocker PTSD uh, type of drug and their side effects that are brain tumors and they need, need to quash the uh, evidence of these experiments. So that's where, uh, that's where we meet James Reese and he uh, slowly unravels this conspiracy after it kills his family and troop and puts together a list and then starts going down that list using the tactics and techniques of the enemy that works so well against us uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and he brings those to home soil and essentially becomes the terrorist, becomes the insurgent that he'd been fighting for the last 16 years in that novel anyway. So yeah, that first scene is uh, uses a hunting rifle from uh, Darcy Eccles out here uh, a, uh, who makes rifles out here in Utah. And it was an amazing guy, by the way. And yeah, that's the, that's the introduction to the series. But really hunting is such a big part of my life. It's a big part of our family's life. All we really eat is wild game. Uh, all we, and I guess that's been since my last deployment uh, is really all we've eaten. So we have freezers full of wild game and we've been very fortunate uh, to be able to hunt locally and then also around the world. So it's very natural for me to talk about and write about those things that are important to me. So that, that background that I have in special operations uh, and then that background and what is a current big part of our life, which is hunting. Yeah, I um, it had my attention uh, immediately when I read that. I mean, you, I knew kind of the premise of the book. Um, and so in that first scene, uh, when he goes to take a shot with a hunting rifle instead of a, a some kind of um, tactical, you know, chassis type rifle, I remember thinking, this is interesting. He's using a hunting rifle instead of some, you know, sniper rifle. And I, and I put a bookmarker in the book and I went and Googled that rifle maker and started looking at his rifles. And from right then I knew that you were a hunter, uh, that you had chosen a custom, you know, a really cool custom hunting rifle to fit that, um, fit that scene in the book. Um, so it, you know, you had my attention as a hunter, uh, from the very beginning, uh, which is one of the reasons we really wanted to reach out with you, um, and talk about your books and, your connection to hunting and things like that. Um, Jay, I, I will let you. People that I have have personal connections with. I love to use their gear in the novels, gear that I've used personally over the years, uh, like Winkler knives, the tomahawk. Like Daniel Winkler is such a great guy, such an amazing knife maker. Made the tomahawks for Last of the Mohicans, that movie, and has done a ton for special operations over the last, uh, well, 20, almost 20 years now. And uh, just a great guy. So I love using those in the novel. And, uh, half based blades, a buddy of mine who made a seal that makes knives out in San Diego. I weave those in. Um, and then love getting to do the research. So go for that second one, getting to go to Mozambique and really uh, dive into the situation out there and talk to the professional hunters, the trackers, how the, uh, the Chinese mining, both illegal and legal operations are affecting the environment, how they're feeding those people with, uh, with meat poaching, uh, what, the, what the ivory poaching looks like out there, those syndicates and those rat lines. And, it's, uh, and weave all that into the, uh, kind of into the flavor of the novel. Yeah, we could uh, exactly. very quickly go off on a bender on geopolitical impacts of China in Africa right now. Uh, I think uh, you kind of cracked the lid on some of that that some people probably aren't aware of, the total impact of how they've exported their operations to the continent to do that. Um, Russia's kinda, actually in, uh, in their big time now, especially in Central yeah. Africa Republic. Uh, Russia's moving yep. in big time, and that finds its way into the pages of, uh, of the third novel, which is one I wanted to write since I was uh, in sixth grade and first read uh, Richard Connell's classic, Mo uh, Most Dangerous Game. So I've always wanted to write this one, and it just wasn't the right one to do right off the bat, out of the gate, but uh, it's now the perfect time as the third book in the series to really explore that hunter versus hunted and the dark side of the man through the, uh, through the eyes of the protagonist. Um, I'm going down some of my lines of questioning here and, and I, you know, we're kind of going ahead of places that we want to go and, and I want to make sure we don't, you know, leave anything in the past on well, some things we want to cover, but 
you know, the big thing is, I know you're asked quite often about, you know, how your military experience shaped your characters and your writing. And it's very evident that, you know, your professional experiences transfers to the pages very well. But one of the things we're trying to get out with hunting ethos with the uh, field ethos here is the background of hunting uh, in youth and how that kind of shapes masculinity and those experiences are kind of lost now, I think on current generations and generations that are coming forward. Um, how did, you know, hunting coming up in your youth and the exposure to, you know, kind of the pain and the work of it, right? It's a, it's kind of a much like, you know, the military experience, you know, getting very comfortable in the suffering uh, that kind of exposure very early on, how did that kind of shape you? And then also uh, find its way into your books as far as the narrative of, you know, manhood and masculinity for kind of how it shaped the character. Sure. So really, you know, about that self-reliance, it's about freedom. And, uh, you know, so I, so I always grew up wanting to hunt. Like I was naturally drawn to it, as I think most of us are at some point. Uh, I think it's a very natural thing to want to do is to provide for your family, provide for the tribe, and then defend that tribe. Those things are kind of the foundation of just who we are as a people. And the reason we're here today is because we had ancestors that were very good at those two things. Uh, otherwise, we would not be here. Um, so, so I grew up shooting, grew up both shooting both bows and rifles, um, but my, my family didn't hunt. So I always wanted to go and I was very jealous of all those kids that got to go out with their dads. Um, but, uh, you know, we went to the range, uh, both with the bow and rifle uh, and pistols as I got a little older, but, uh, but, but, it was, but we didn't hunt. And so, so I had to wait. And my first hunting experience where I finally got out there was as a sniper sustainment trip in 2000. So I uh, finally got out there up at a place in, uh, I won't say the name of it because I don't think they advertise really what they do, sure. uh, up in, uh, in northern Washington state and got my first deer up there and uh, <laughs> with my sniper weapon system. And uh, <laughs> it was, so yeah, one shot, but, uh, but it was an amazing experience, you know, and we hung that deer in the tree and we're slicing the meat off it and we're searing it on the grill and it was just it was exactly what I had always wanted to do. And uh, it was a very natural thing for me to do. So from then on, um, I was, I was all in. Of course, September 11th happened not too far after that. And we got into a whole different kind of hunting, uh, of which there are similarities between hunting humans and hunting animals. There are patterns of life. There's, we do the same thing with animals as we do with humans. And I talk a lot about that in, in, the, in uh, the author's note to the, the third novel that I'm finishing up now. Um, I really wanted to explore that piece of it. But uh, as, as we got further along, uh, we really wanted guys to get out there. We wanted them that people who hadn't hunted before um, to put a bullet into something that was living and breathing before they did it to a human overseas. So we got to do these pretty amazing sniper sustainment trips. And I always tried to jump on those. And then as I got a little more senior and I had kids that started to show an interest in hunting naturally without any prodding from me, um, then we went really all in uh, on it. And so we've been, yeah, I guess the last maybe 10 years, 10, 11, 12 years now, we have just been in and uh, all over the country, all over the world. And our little bungalow in Coronado, California was just filled with taxidermy. So it did, uh, didn't really fit the motif of a beach bungalow uh, there in California, but people would come in and it kind of got to be almost a, a joke in that, uh, that it didn't really, really fit the beach motif, but people would come in and people would start taking out their phones and take pictures and video of all these things uh, from all over the world on the walls. Um, so uh, my wife has told me I need a cabin though out our, our new house. So. <laughs> We have the mountain modern thing going here. So all our, the Europeans are up, very tastefully done. Uh, but everything else is waiting for uh, for the cab, for the writer's cabin, which uh, hopefully is coming soon. Sounds like the rules at my house. Um, I love that you guys uh, uh, found a clever label for um, uh, military-sponsored hunting trips and the si sniper sustainment uh, yeah. uh, missions. Um, you've always got to brand things carefully when you really want to just go hunting. Um, but it sounds like you guys ace that pretty good. <laughs> you got the branding right. Yeah, um, yeah. Jay, um, I know you have a structure you want us to follow. So um, let's just kind of keep going through your list. Yeah, man. No, you know, not getting too clinical. Um, you know, kind of keeping on the same vein and, and going back to the topic we kind of put a pin in here before the last question. You know, you know, we've all followed your social media for quite some time and you know, leading up to your development for a true believer, we saw all of, you know, the anti-poaching research you were doing, the trips to Africa. Um, that was fantastic to watch, knowing that the next book was coming down the pike. Um, you know, even when I got to read the book, you know, and dive into true believer, just seeing those details and how those transitioned, you know, where you mentioned, you know, how the PHs carry their rifle Africa style, you know, and, um, and then the continued, you know, clear thing for the Land Cruiser. 
uh, which I think a lot of us geek out on the same way. Uh, you know, are there any nuggets from your, you know, your recent trip? I know you've done something very similar with your experiences going to Russia um, that you can share, which will kind of influence some of the character detail and, um, you know, some takeaways from that experience without giving too much away of, you know, what we're all patiently waiting for in the third book. Sure. Yeah. So I went to Mozambique uh, uh, and Russia. I had a list of things that I wanted to investigate while I was over there. So I knew it was going to be hectic because it'd be crazy. We're going to be up early, up late and all that. Uh, heading out, doing our thing. Um, and then, of course, those questions led to, more, led to different ones. And particularly in Africa, they were so helpful. Everybody wanted to help there. They found out that uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was really, I don't want to say normalize, but I want to say uh, use the medium of popular fiction to influence culture. And that means by putting hunting in, um, in a way that really hasn't been shown or hasn't been talked about in uh, most novels that you pull off the, uh, the shelf that you think or you're pulling off a political thriller or a spy novel or whatever else. Well, this one has these sub themes of, of hunting uh, woven in to the storyline. Uh, in Africa, those guys, those PHs all wanted to help. It's, uh, they're all named in the, in the acknowledgments and uh, they could not have been great. You know, so nice. And you guys know, you guys have been over there. So Russia was a little different. So I just got back from the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, and that's when we started off here. We started off drinking a little whiskey, just for those uh, that are listening. And uh, Jason sent me some Southern Rye whiskey here from uh, 13th Colony Distilleries, which is uh, awesome, by the way. But I was hesitant to take my first sip. And I was hesitant because in Russia, uh, they ran out of bottled water for us at this camp. It was a pretty remote backcountry camp. Uh, they, they fly in on M MI-8 helicopters, which are, you know, workhorses. Like, you can put a lot of weight in those things. And essentially, they move the camps in and out of the backcountry each season um, because people uh, and people in the military will go and ransack it if there's nobody there. Um, and, uh, and they can move that stuff in these helos. They can move so much weight in those helos. So they brought in bottled water or whatever. Then they ran out. And they said, oh, this is no problem, my American friend. We have this spring, and we have no beaver here in Kamchatka Peninsula. So and we, this water tastes so good. It is better than the bottle. Well, if they tell you that and you're in uh, far eastern Russia, pull out your filter or your iodine tablets immediately um, because, uh, yes, there is Giardia over there. There are all sorts of parasites over there. And three of us, luckily, we were home. But the day we got home, like at midnight, a few hours after I got home, wow, seven days. So one of the things they gave me was whatever they give you for Giardia which happens to be the same thing they give alcoholics to make them vomit violently if they take a sip of alcohol. <laughs> so I took that a few days ago and I wanted to share it with you guys tonight. Uh, so <laughs> I'm a little bit hesitant to take that first sip because I was worried that, uh, that I might start spewing violently. But that is not the case. So uh, enough time. Well, we can edit. We can if you start throwing up, we'll just edit that out. <laughs> yeah, no, so I'm all good. But, but you need to keep. But we need to keep going. But we will edit it out. Yeah, it's blooper reel. Right. Save Steve, that. Charlie, Mike. Uh, <laughs> it was a little different. It was. Uh, they were very suspicious of all the questions that I was asking, and uh, I was asking them. I was asking about military stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, bases around there. I'm asking about the weapons that they use, both for hunting and defense, and what those laws are pertaining to those weapons over there. So I'm trying to get all this information just as, as part of, I don't know how it's going to look into the storyline exactly, um, but it's that local flavor that I'm looking for. I have a few things that I want to get in, uh, in Russian um, and that I can work into the storyline language-wise. And then I also want to learn about the, how do they forage over there? What kind of berries are they eating? What kind of mushrooms are they eating? Uh, what kind of fish do they like? Do they not like? Um, but, uh, what are they hunting? What are they trapping? How do they do that? What season? Do they have seasons or do they do it all the time? What is the poaching like over there? Is there poaching? Um, so all those questions, but they were very suspicious. And I've been thinking about it, you know, back, let's say, let's take it 30, 40 years ago, um, when you get asked a lot of questions by anyone in the former Soviet Union, uh, like that, you don't want to be asked a lot of questions. You don't want to get on anybody's radar over there. And so I think that really played into their suspicion, even though I'm in their camp, you know, we're out there hunting, we're out there fishing. And, uh, but they were just a tad bit more skeptical than, uh, than the PHs in, uh, in Africa who were all in on, uh, on wanting to help and tell the story and be, get, uh, get the, uh, the backstory on hunting in Africa, Chinese influence and poaching. And they wanted all that, uh, anything that they could give me, anything that I asked, they were all in. But 
Russia was a tad bit different as far as collecting that information and interviewing people. So I thought that was just in and of itself uh, very interesting. But I got some great stuff and it's all going to find its way into the pages of the novel. Uh, one interesting thing was uh, the snowmobiles over there. So the, their sleds are a little different than over here. They, uh, they like have one skid in the front for the hunters and trappers because as they're going through that tundra uh, and roots and everything else, that one skid in front is less likely to, to catch a root, to catch a tree or whatever else. So they can maneuver that sled through the tundra a little better than they can uh, one that has the two skis in the front that we're used to over here. So I got pictures of those and I'll work that into the storyline. Um, another thing that was interesting, land cruisers the world over. I was pleasantly surprised in Kamchatka Peninsula to find a lot of land cruisers, which was very cool. That's awesome. Um, so just out of curiosity, did any of those guys in camp there uh, have any idea what your background was at all? So, I don't, I didn't really highlight the military side of things. Um, I said, hey, you know, I'm an author, I'm writing this novel, and uh, I'd really love to get to ask you some questions. And, you know, you build up some trust each night by having a little vodka and all the rest of it. Um, vodka, it's not my favorite drink, by the way, but, you know, I, you know, when in Rome. Or when, when, in Rome. when in Rome, yeah. So, yeah, you build up those relationships, ask those questions, and, uh, you know, you hope they, they, they lead to other things. But, it didn't lead to as many other things as uh, as my questions did and the relationships did in uh, in Africa, which uh, was yeah. very interesting to me. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so um, what were you over there hunting? Brown bear. Yeah, so Brown bear. So I knew I had to get over there because I wanted to put boots on the ground. I was trying to figure out a yep. good way to get over there. And I figured if I'm going all that way, it's going to be a brown bear hunt. And then uh, a buddy of mine, um his, uh, randomly i mentioned that to him and he said oh i had this fishing trip going over there we've been planning it for two years and somebody just dropped out do you want to go and i said well i really want to want to get over there and hunt um and so we checked into it and sure enough uh, we we're there the first week of brown bear season over there um and so we added it on for me and for him and uh so that was the that was the main point of my trip uh over there yeah the brown bear hunt but man, successful it rushed, hunt uh it was and i'm um, right. trying to figure out how to tell that story and i know we talked about uh, maybe doing something about it and i have it, yep. it, it a new one um good. So good. Mine. It was pretty mine was pretty you know one shot bear pops up done deal um but my friends that i uh i accompanied him on um we had the wounded bear going into the thick brush i have the guide handing me a rusty old I mean, I want to say Soviet here, uh, side by side, 12 gauge with rusty slugs uh, mm. to get out of the boat to go in to the thick stuff. So, man, I've not felt so alive since Ramadi 06. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a language barrier there. You're being handed this uh, this shotgun. You know, you've never shot it before. And off you go after a wounded, what ended up being a uh, 10 plus foot um, bear. So uh, it was, uh, I haven't gone into, to, uh, to the bush after or the tall grass after a wounded leopard but i think the feeling would be similar uh as a yeah leopard. it would have to be yeah big stuff after a wounded bear um and i'll tell you well i, I don't want to ruin it because i want to write about it and really think about it a little more yeah uh, keep us keep us waiting on i mean it just we'll, we'll keep the expectation up we'll leave it at that um can't wait to read it I did take a picture of that shotgun um and it's a cool looking shotgun and it felt good in my hands i trained so much for my Mozambique trip trip with the uh I brought a Krieg off 500 416 Nitro Express and I went to FTW Ranch in Texas to train specifically with the double rifle and so I got so good with that double rifle and uh, I just felt so good in my hand and even though this was a shotgun obviously but that it was a side-by-side -side, and I only had four rounds <laughs> I had two of them in my hand and two of them in the in the uh in the shotgun um it felt good and it felt like I was carrying that double rifle in Africa as I went in. And I did know that that shotgun was made in the same factory as Kalashnikov. And so I had a, uh, having faced the working end of those uh, a couple of times, <laughs> I, I had a good feeling that it was going to work. And yeah. It did. Yeah. You know, the techniques that you use to write the books, to research the books, you know, to give people that kind of ground flavor, you know, folks that haven't been there and don't experience it, you know, the place that you go have a smell, they have an experience of energy, the way it kind of feels when you get there. Um, you know, in my personal opinion, I think you've done a fantastic job of capturing that and putting that into the books. I can definitely feel that when I, when I read that. Um, 
I can't put the books down. A lot of times I re- get on my, uh, my iPad, my wife complains to me cause I'll be up till, you know, one o'clock in the morning trying to get it, you know, a couple more chapters down. So, um, I, I think a lot of us definitely appreciate the efforts you're going to and the lengths you're going to, to make that happen. One of the, the big things and we kind of talked about in the beginning here is, you know, Jason and I are both big book nerds too, and, uh, gear nerds. So I kind of wanted to wrap up a little bit of my questioning here with, um, on the book side, you know, often you share, you know, both your writing on social media about how reading and the, you know, the multitude of authors that have shaped and influenced you. Um, are there kind of a top four or five books you think that are a, a must read for, you know, aspiring hunters, adventurers, or something that kind of really is a keystone on what you think would help influence modern masculinity? Yeah, so I'm actually going to start a reading list this month, and I'm going to use, if I choose six books a month. And on the newsletter, I'll talk about why those books were influential uh, to me. Um, some will be fiction, some will be nonfiction, some will be um, kind of leadership oriented, some might be field manual, but just certain books that had uh, an impact on me at certain stages of my life. Um, so I'll probably post those on social media, but really the newsletter will have each, a little write up on each one of those. Um, and before I left the military, uh, I was asked to put together a reading list because I had a reputation of being a reader but they asked me to put together a professional reading list for the Naval Special Warfare Center. So I did that and I broke it down by section and talked about why each section was important to visit. Um, and I sent it off and then I got out. So I have no idea if they actually adopted it, but uh, I'm gonna use that now and take some of those books and, uh, and the, um, uh, the reasons why I think those, were, those are important for professional development um, and work those into this reading list as well. But uh, as far as a kind of a foundation, um, yeah, there are, there are a few, and there are some that uh, are hunting-oriented and some that are not, but uh, the, the question is about the hunting-oriented ones, so um, I'll hit those. But uh, so I don't know if you guys remember, but you know, we just talked about it a little while ago, the, uh, the Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. So as a, as a young person growing up, reading that book in the sixth grade, and I've read it many times since, it's a short story, and it, uh, that one's the one get through in an hour and a a sixth grader a seventh grader an eighth grader can get there through that thing in an hour as well and uh, so that's a good one I think uh, part of that part of that foundation um, because it's uh, yeah it's about hunting ish um, but really it's uh, it's about that that dark side of man and it's uh, and uh, of course adversity Um, but uh, that's a that's a good one to start with to build a fire by Jack London you know, these aren't not necessarily all hunting specific, but uh, but they're outdoors. They're they're foundational both uh, as literature and uh, and uh, and outdoor specific. So, uh, to build a fire, do you guys remember that one? Jack London, amazing short story. My favorite as far as anything that Jack London did. Um, and you can get through that one in a couple hours as well, maybe even less than an hour. Um, but a uh, fantastic story. If you guys haven't read it or the, the listeners haven't read it, I don't want to ruin how it ends. So to build a fire by Jack London. It's, uh, I'm taking notes because I'm going to have to read that one ASAP. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and so there's two yep. versions. The, the most prolific one will be the one that you find the most easy. So you'll have to let, let me know how it ends. And, uh, and I'll tell you yep. if you read, you read the one that, uh, that, that I'm thinking, but, um, but, but yeah, that's that one um, for sure. And then on the specific hunting front, it's a, I like the ones that aren't necessarily, that hunting is the backdrop. It's not necessarily about, so there I went and I went into the woods, I went into the bush and then I, uh, you know, this thing charged and okay, like beginning, middle, end. I like the ones that that's the backdrop to something else, the backdrop to a human story. Um, and that's why the, uh, the Hemingway, um, also a short story, um, The Short Happy Life of Francis McComber. Because uh, yes, hunting is the backdrop for that. And you can get through it in way less, than an hour, but uh, it's that uh, you know it's that relationship piece, and it's uh, uh, kind of uh, I don't even really want to ruin it for anybody that, that hasn't read it yet, because uh, all of these have the endings that really make them uh, that give them that longevity, that give them that timelessness. So I don't want to ruin the endings of any of these for anyone, but uh, hunting specific that one, and then on the fiction front, uh, you know, for somebody that's uh, that, that loves this genre and to uh, Last of the Breed by Louisa Moore, just an incredible book written in, uh, I think, 87, <laughs> speaking of 87, with uh, uh, you know, Lethal Weapon coming out. But uh, yeah, Last of the Breed by Louisa Moore. Now, he's known for his Westerns, of course, but he wrote a couple other ones that weren't Westerns. 
and you know, they have Western themes, certainly, but, uh, but they uh, don't fit that Western genre. And Last of the Breed is a book I haven't read since the late 80s, but I wanted to capture some of the spirit of that novel and what it felt like to read that as a you know, 12, 13 year old kid, however old I was at the time when I read that thing and uh, capture the spirit and the magic of reading that and have that be what people get out of my third novel. Um, Savage Sun. So um, I didn't want to reread it because I didn't want it to influence me too much. Instead, I just wanted to grab the spirit of that. So it's about an Air Force test pilot that's forced down in, uh, in Russia and is thrown into a prison camp because they want to question him on this new stealth technology. Uh, he has a background though. He comes from uh, uh, Native American and Scottish stock and he escapes and goes on the run across Siberia. Uh, tracing the route his ancestors took to get to the, the new world and uh, hunting along the way, uh, trapping along the way while he's fighting off the, uh, the Russians. And so when you're reading that book in 1987, of course, you know, uh, I don't know if it's the, the height of the Cold War, but it sure felt like it was uh, to a kid at that time. Uh, so that was, a, that was a great read. So um, as far as adventure type stuff that covers the different, uh, different angles out there, I think those, are the, those were foundational to me. Awesome. No, that's a great list. That's uh, more than we could have asked for as far as direction for anybody, you know, aspiring to learn more and kind of get that fire in the belly, so to speak, you know, about the the entire movement here. Uh, My last question, you know, kind of shifting back to the gear, you know, and you're known for being prolific with being very spot on and poignant with the the gear descriptions of use and application. Uh, This is kind of one of my favorite for, you know, fellow military folks is you know, what is a primary or favorite piece of gear that almost never misses your loadout, you know, when you travel or head out into the field? Sure. So, uh, you know, I always have that tourniquet on me and uh, always have my sunglasses. I always have my game <laughs> sunglasses. They were on every deployment with me. And uh, I was an early adopter, I guess, um, yeah. back in the day. But yeah, my Gator sunglasses, even if it's dark out, you know, uh, you never know how long you're going to be out there. So yeah, those sunglasses and that tourniquet. Um, they're staged everywhere. I have backpacks and cars and you know, they're all over the place. I have this little hunting rig that I wear um, when I go out that has some, some first line gear on it. It's always uh, attached to me and uh, tourniquets right there on the outside that I can break away and, and no one's noticed. So um, I think those are the two, the two pieces of kit that are really always with me in one way, shape or form. Nope. That's great. Yeah, I've always been a gear guy, so it was very natural for me to to write about that gear. I didn't have to do you know too much research um, because I've been even before the military. I was always uh, backpacking with my family up in Northern California. I was always you know doing these things, and I was always looking at that gear for whatever reason. I wanted that that if some if uh, if I got killed in the backcountry, it wasn't going to be because I wasn't using the best gear. Um, same thing like <laughs> yeah. um, if I miss <laughs> if I miss my shot, it's going to be because of me, um, not because of the equipment. Um, so I've always been a gear guy. It was natural for me to be a gear guy in the military because I wanted my guys to have the, uh, the, the latest, the greatest um, equipment possible as we went down range. So I was always going to SHOT Show just on my own dime because uh, typically the uh, private sector was far ahead of what we were getting, especially pre-September 11th. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I wanted my guys to have that, that best gear, the lightest stuff so we could go faster and farther. Um, and I got to the for my first SEAL team in 97, and I was so surprised at how little they knew about layering systems. I mean, we're still getting cotton uniforms up until just a few years ago, um, but they had no idea. And I'm coming from a background where you know, people didn't like, what's REI? Um, you know, they didn't know about synthetics. They didn't know about, uh, you know, how to layer those things and why it was important to do so. Um, uh, and it was just amazing to me that, uh, that most of the people in the military, even in special operations, even in the SEAL teams, had no idea about what what kind of boots to get for different terrain to wear what you're wearing with weight on your back and why it's appropriate to wear one kind of boot rather than something else when you're when you're when you're packing a huge load uh, in the, the special reconnaissance mission for a week. So uh, so I was very surprised about that. So I got to to apply what I'd learned just growing up in the outdoors, uh, and then I got to take it to the next level uh, in, during my time in the military, and then I continue to do that in uh, on the outside now because it's just a part of who i am no that's awesome couldn't agree more um i very much a lot of the same behavior you know the ifac with gunshot treat wound uh, tourniquets in the driver's side door there everywhere yeah. i go exactly um, gets packed out uh i am notorious for wearing sunglasses all the time as jason can probably attest to as well uh you know there's also a joke in there somewhere about how do you spot a navy seal uh, with the gator 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> beer, uh, usually some hair gel. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice. yeah. Yeah, mostly true. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, fantastic responses. And I think you finished up right there on the end with the gear, kind of get back to our initial conversation of just really self-reliance, you know, as being a, an overarching theme. So um, appreciate you really rounding that out. And, um, I will say for um, for somebody who loves gear, hunting gear, and just all gear in general, uh, your books are um, just kind of a uh, gear heaven um, for gear nerds like me. So um, I stop uh, quite a bit in your books and hit Google uh, when I come across something I haven't heard of. And uh, of course, then it goes from Google, I go straight to my phone and follow them on social media so I can you know, so I can see what these people are actually doing. And um, it makes the reading experience of yours just a lot of fun. It's very interactive for somebody that appreciates gear, somebody that's somebody that's a, a devoted a lot of their life to hunting. Um, your books are just so much fun to read because there's just so much there that um, that you can relate to that can send your imagination down those those rabbit holes of just, you know, hit pause on the book for a minute and go look into this stuff. And then, you know, you're looking forward to getting back to the book later. And man, just a lot of fun, both the reads. Um, I will say that um, I loved book one. It was awesome. I uh, couldn't wait for book two. Um, usually I, I remember reading uh, Term Limits and, um, and then wondering if uh, the first Mitch Rap book was going to be cool uh or if i was going to like it because it was kind of a different concept and then i fell in love with the mitch rap series well with your two books um i man i just had so much fun uh with book one and then um i man it it was fast paced there was a lot going on in book one um there's just a lot of fun there um book two um started with uh sailing and then jumping to other characters in the story and man, it, to me, the pace of that book is uh, one of the best I've ever read, period. Um, it just, from start to finish, um, it was fun from the beginning. Uh, the whole sailing theme at the beginning was was a lot of fun. Um, and then to find out about what was going on with these other characters while, um, while, um, while the sailing was continuing around the world and just fleshing those things out, you, you gave plenty of time for that while that journey was going on. Man, I'm telling you, um, as far as just a fun book to read, um, to me, a book needs to be paced right for it to be truly fun from start to finish. And it was it was the perfect pace. Um, so um, I've got to say, um, book two, one of the best I've ever read, but a huge, uh, um, a huge follow up to, to a successful first book. So I can only imagine what this um, what this next book is going to be like. It's going to be amazing. Oh, thank you so much. The, uh, you know, it took a risk by starting out with a lot more development and depth than, uh, than the first one because I felt like it would be disingenuous to have uh, the protagonist, James Reese, deal with the events that were so dramatic in the first book uh, in just a paragraph and then just jump into the story. Uh, and part of that really was going back to the feelings and emotions I had around transition in general. Uh, because we're all going to go through transition in life. We're all going to face adversity in life. And what really defines us is how we deal with that adversity. Um, so main character in book number two uh, is dealing with adversity. He's learning to live again. And he needs to go on that journey. He needs to find out how to live again. Uh, and yeah. uh, in just a paragraph. And there is no better way to do it than that, that journey, than going to Africa, than finding that new purpose, finding that next mission in life, which he does. And then, of course, uh, the government finds him and sends him on, uh, you know, brings him back into the fold, which is where the action really kicks off. And then uh, for book three, Savage Son, uh, I think you guys are really going to like that one because it's, uh, well, the hunting theme in there and then a lot of archery. So a lot of archery, both as a therapy. And then uh, in the, I don't want to ruin it, but in the more climactic chapters of them, yeah. we'll all come full circle. So um, I'm excited to be able to write about archery, which is something I'm passionate about, and uh, and get that out there to the uh, to the general public. So I don't think it's something that really gets uh, written about too much. So part of, uh, well, let me just address kind of a fun one. Um, this is going to drive you nuts being a gear person to even answer this question what's your favorite rifle that you own oh 
man. Hunting rifle. I will say that. Let me let me say hunting rifle. Favorite hunting rifle. Okay, good. Narrow it down. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I have to say it's the uh, Rifle Zinc 300 Win Mag. Um, I just love the 300 Win Mag as a round because I trained so uh, uh, just in such depth with that round and uh, in the military. It was really our workhorse in the SEAL teams. Um, of course, that was pre-September 11th. And even after September 11th, we used it quite extensively. But uh, but after September 11th, particularly in, uh, well, both Afghanistan and Iraq, but my experience with it was most was in Iraq. Um, was using that SR-25, that Mark 11 the auto-loading 7.62 weapon system because it was so versatile. So you could use it to clear rooms and then you could go up and take, uh, take an elevated position and use it as a cyber weapon system. So the versatility of using that SR-25 Mark 11 autoloader um, really proved its worth. Um, but in training, you know, I grew up and I trained, uh, I went to sniper school before September 11th. So I went through sniper school in 2000, uh, where we pretty much used the lessons of Vietnam. So it was much more of an art when I went through. Now I'd say it's more of a, it's an art and a science with all the technology and all the innovations that have come uh, online since September 11th. Um, but because I trained so much with that three and a one mag, and really back when I went through sniper school, that was your baby. Like that was the one you could reach out there and touch someone with. And uh, you really got to know that round in all sorts of different conditions uh, so well that, uh, that I think my, my, the favorite, my, my go-to um, bolt action rifle in, uh, in that arsenal is my, uh, my rifle zinc, uh, titanium, so it's super light, uh, 300 wind mag. It's awesome. Um, I think I told you, uh, when we spoke the other day, I was heading into Atlanta to visit a SEAL sniper named Davis Boyce. Um, and Davis and I, uh, recently came back from a hunt in Africa together. He hunted with a 300 wind mag. Um, again, same reason as you, um, that was, that was um, what he trained on. He knew the ballistics of it. Um, his wind calls with it were just, I mean, he didn't even have to think about what he was doing. Um, I watched him take seven animals with seven one-shot uh, kills in Africa. All the shots were just as clean as they could be. Um, it's about as humane uh, a safari as anybody has ever um put down on that continent in my opinion it, it was just fun to watch somebody that had that skill set with that caliber and they truly knew what they were doing so i'm not surprised that you went you went with something that you really trained with that uh that you were now hunting with um it's one of my favorite rounds uh i want to switch gears for just a second um one thing i like to talk about with people that um are you know die hard hunters now that that also might have some different perspective uh i, I do um, it, 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 at least I can, I'm, I'm sensing that you're a family man just from following, uh, following some of your social media. I don't want to talk much about your family, but what I do want to uh, touch on is, um, what do you think are the biggest problems, um, we're, we're facing for hunting and the future of hunting and bringing up another generation of hunters? Um, I see things in the younger generation and, uh, I just want to know what your thoughts are with your experience with the younger generation and where you see hunting going in the next decade or two. Right. It's tough. You know, it's, uh, uh, some of those models that were put in place in the last 25 years, as far as, uh, recruiting and retaining hunters really haven't panned out. Um, uh, cause it's, you know, we're busy. Everyone's busy and taking some, a new person hunting. That's hard. Uh, especially when you, uh, you have, you have your own family, um, or you, uh, you get a, a day or two off a, a year even. To get out there and get a feel. Um, so for someone to take that time and bring a new hunter who is then just going to go once maybe with that person, um, it's, it's tough. Um, so I, so I don't have good answers, but I know that we as hunters, um, you know, we can, we can influence our circles and all of our circles are, uh, are different in that, uh, that we reach different numbers of people. Some of us, um, maybe it's just a friend, others of us, it's just our immediate family. Uh, some of it, it's an extended family. Some people have uh, have networks uh, that they reach. Like let's let's use Jocko as an example. He's now getting into hunting. He's going on his first hunt this month, um, and uh, got into archery this last year. With uh, uh, I think I was there when he took his first shot with uh, with John Dudley, and uh, you know he has a huge uh, sphere of influence now. Um, and it's not just preaching to the choir. It's uh, it's people from all walks of life, um, like with Joe Rogan. 
uh, guys like that that have this huge influence of not just hunters that can bring people in. So social media is a very powerful tool and it can work for us or against us. And by social media, I include podcasts in that, all new media. Um, so it can work for us, it can work against us, and it all depends on how we tell that story. But there are people out there that are very interested in uh, returning to, um, to what is most basic as far as nutrition uh, and getting those people that are into CrossFit and into health and knowing where their food comes from, especially when they see where some of the stuff that they buy in the grocery store actually does come from and how many people have touched that steak between the time that it is uh, uh, it, it leaves the cow uh, until it ends up on the shelf at the grocery store. Uh, and then just knowing that you can get out there and you can hunt, kill, and harvest your own meat and you know exactly where that animal has lived, what it's been eaten, and how many people have touched it before it ends up on your grill. And we get to live that with the family. So that's why I love doing this with my family. I love um, pulling out uh, uh, an elk, whatever, tender one, backstrap, whatever, and grilling it and then talking to, uh, to the kids. Like, hey, to our daughter, remember when we got this last year? Oh, that was so amazing. Remember that shot you took? And then, so they become part of that meal. They become, uh, come, they get to relive it again. And, and hopefully they will influence their, their, their friends, uh, their families one day. So I think that's really the best that we can do as hunters is be yeah. uh, uh, good ambassadors, be, uh, be good role models to our family, to our friends, and portray hunting in a positive light. Um, and really talk about those things that, uh, that aren't even hunting specific, that are just it's self-reliance, that freedom. That sure. Freedom all those things that are so positive about getting out there and getting up the, uh, the exercise, the getting away from iPads and iPhones and being out there with your kids, uh, not looking down and saying, oh, I just got to finish this real, this quick little text. Hold on one second. Well, no, you don't have that option in a lot of places where you go hunting because there's no cell service. Um, and you have to put that phone down and you have to be there present in the moment uh, with your son, with your daughter in that tree stand uh, or on that stock. And, uh, and there's valuable life lessons out there. So that's what really people are going to be attracted to, I think. Not necessarily the, uh, oh, check out this buck on my wall. Look how, big, look how big that is. Like, it's not what it's, that's going to be about going forward. It's going to be about getting out there with your kids, about getting away from that elect electronic leash and teaching your kids and your family to be self-reliant. So that's really the positive message that, uh, that we can talk about and that we can show as uh, as. Hunter. Man, that's a great answer, and and uh, thank you for, um, you know, relating your own family experiences. I I didn't want to ask much about your family just because of your background. I can tell you keep that stuff pretty guarded and for good reason. Um, so thank you for for being open and honest about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I talk about it because it's so, so it's such a big part of my life. It's the biggest part of my life. So it's very natural for me to talk about, but you're right. I don't show pictures of them on social media. I don't talk to them, their names. So things like that. So yeah separation there but it's very natural sure it'd be unnatural if i didn't uh, talk about it so i'm, I'm more than happy i will say you, you you mentioned that you said i'm not sure i really have an answer for it but i do want to point out because you might not see it from your perspective but uh, the elements of hunting that you're including in your books uh, that will be read by hunters and non-hunters alike that will fall in love with um, with the stories that you're telling um, that will do a you know a tremendous service to uh to hunting in my in my opinion there will be kids um all over the world that read these books that that um will be interested in hunting because of the stories you told in these books that um that may ne you know fielding hunters may never have been at the forefront of your mind when you started writing but these books will field hunters um and that's pretty cool yeah, thank you and it was it, it was part of the calculus it was something i wanted to incorporate uh one because it's very natural for me to talk about and people can really identify with you know the word especially you know today but uh that they can identify with that authenticity piece uh when they know where it's coming from they know if it's real and if it's not um so it's very natural for me, for me to talk about very natural for me to incorporate into the storyline and something i wanted to uh, incorporate into the storylines um, because I think it's important and, uh, and no one else is really doing it in this genre. Um, last question I have, um, we kind of have an idea of what direction uh, at least this third book is going to start in. Um, so now that we know that, we know where you've just been hunting, what's the next hunt? Where are you going next? 
I'm about to take off for Alaska. So uh, it'd be my, it's my first brown bear hunt was uh, in Kamchatka Peninsula. My second one will uh, will be in Alaska. So I'm about to head up there. And oh, wow. 10 days or so. Um, head up there for about two weeks. Um, and so, yeah, really looking forward to, to that one. That's been on the books for a while. Awesome. Awesome. Um, uh, we'll be safe on that hunt uh, for sure. Um, come back and continue riding. Don't get eaten. Um, Jay, do you have any, uh, do you have any follow on questions? Well, one, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to see Jocko take it for a shot, you know, just to see him turn and look at you and go, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, yeah, uh, you just kind of, though, when you have John Dudley right there next to you for your first shot, yeah. so things are going to go well. Um, that was the two and a half hour podcast I was referencing, by the way. Nice. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, Intense. It was a great time together. Uh, but you know, just kind of wrap up, you know, kind of where you're going to be with the book. And then if there's kind of any uh, professional associations or charities you'd like to highlight that you might be working with, uh, we always like to to end on that point. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's this uh, plate actually what brought us to uh, to Park City and um, is uh, the National Ability Centers. The National Ability Center is out here and they work with people of all abilities, disabilities. They work with veterans, PTSD, TBI, um, and really get people outside and help them reach their full potential, no matter what that is. Like skiing and rock climbing and biking and water skiing and uh, river rafting and just all these amazing things. Um, so that really brought us out here. Um, we have a, a middle child with some severe special needs. And, um, and uh, so, so being close to that uh, organization, which is just incredible, the Marriott family really did a ton to set that place up. So it's a beautiful facility and uh, they do amazing, amazing things. So uh, that's something that I, I support and it's very near and dear to my heart. So, um, so that's, the, that's the big one for us. That's great. And that's National Ability Center? Yep, National Ability Center out here in Park City, Utah. Awesome be looking into that as soon as we get off this call oh, thank you thank you much appreciate it jack we really appreciate it i've been looking forward to uh to doing this for a while um i will say i'm i'm really amped to read this um to whatever you put on paper about your hunting trip no pressure um but you know would just like to read it if it's something you decide you want to um to put in a magazine um we'd love to do it and um and i just can't you know even if we don't do that, I'm just looking forward to reading the story um, and actually, will this be your first, you know, full account of a hunting story that you wrote uh, with the with the possibility of, of an article? It would be. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, man. A little while ago, but it's more generic. Um, so this would be the more. Uh, the first one that's a kind of a start to finish specific hunt um and i, I outlined it on the on the plane on the way home because while i was there i didn't know how it was going to go because there were some other things that, that yeah. happened there that delayed everything and it was there was some chaos and uh so i really want to tell that whole story in an appropriate way and uh and it's uh, i think it's a unique one uh so um yeah looking forward to, to doing that and sending something your way can't wait can't wait to read it um hey thank you again um so much um, I am going to um, buy uh, a handful of, of, um, of True Believer and send them to you uh, to see if you have time to uh, sign them and send them back. I'd like to give them out as Christmas presents. And I'd like to give True Believer out and tell people when I give it to them, hey, here's the second book. You got to go buy the first book. Um, so they'll, they'll read both of them, but they've got to buy at least one um to to actually get really into the brand and enjoy it so um i'm going to send you a box of books if you don't mind awesome i'd love to thank you so much really appreciate that no problem love to support i love to support a, a great writer um thanks again that's all i've got jay if you have anything else um i'm done no all set thanks so much jack appreciate you coming on pill ethos hey thank you guys for having me on and uh, let's do it again sometime Thanks for listening to the Field Ethos Podcast. Subscribe for updates on all future episodes. You can follow us on social at Field Ethos Journal. And don't forget to visit fieldethos.com for stories and interviews from the leading voices in the outdoor community.